I'm going to pray. God, thank you. And thank you for the things we can't see, the supernatural things, and that we serve a supernatural God. That's what we need. And help us be close to you today and on. And also, I'll just say this from church. Um, Satan, stay out of our business. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. So thanks again. It feels like family to be back here. We've been coming here over 20 years, and we landed on Friday night. We were late. Got here, and Josh let Sahaley come and sing. I thought, man, this takes like our house. We pulled right into here, the first stop, and Sahaley singing. The next morning, because the time is a little different, I was up at about 1.30, and then 2.30. So went for a ride on the beach, came back. It's still dark. Went for a walk with my daughter, came back. It got light. We went surfing. At, you know, I don't know if you know, but we're kind of on the same surf team. Yeah. On the same skill level. But um, there was nobody out there for us to hurt. So we had, a, we had a great time. And it feels like home. We, when I went to Fuller, I, I went to... Um, First Christian Church, Pasadena, and we have some people there. We're, Sylvia and McMillan, where are y'all at? Right there. That's my, also my family. But I started coming to Point Doom to climb 1993, 1992. So I feel like I'm old timer there now, every time I show up. So we're glad to be here. And what I wanted to do this time when we came back was share with you what has happened the last year since we saw y'all last year. We came and reported last year. And, and I'm gonna be looking at you for time. You're gonna give me five minutes. <laughs> so, and, and the, Josh has asked me in an email about a, the theme. Wow. I think if I had to summarize it, I'd say this. Ask Jesus to help and do it his way. That's my theme. And as Karen said in the beginning, sometimes we can't help ourselves. We just can't. I was just reading a book on prayer and about why do you pray and all this. And the, the author said, well, one reason you pray is that's how you get to know Jesus and that's how you change. And he thought, well, that's not what happened to me. I just woke up one night in the middle of the night and knew Jesus was real. I met him and I followed him. So it happened spontaneously. But then I remembered when I, the next morning I remembered, no, it didn't just happen by itself. My mother had been praying for me for 20 years. Wow. So, we serve an active Savior who's here to help us right now in every problem. And as I think you go on in life, um, I'm kind of ha I'm 58 later on this month. You start having more experiences, at least I do, about things that didn't work, about prayers that weren't answered. And so I feel like sometimes your faith is going down. It should be going up. I mean, you know, in life, you have no choice about physical stuff. You're going to go down. And so the young people... You know, enjoy it now. But <laughs> you're going to go down. But, but you have a choice about the spiritual side of our lives. That can go up. And that's the eternal part. But sometimes, because of disappointments, because of our own sin or other people's sins, it doesn't go up. And when it's like that, all I know to do is just say, Jesus, help me. And I'm going to praise you no matter what happens. God inhabits the praises of his people. The more it's, it, there are no reasons to praise, the more, the better the time to praise, and Satan can't stand it. He's our big enemy. He cannot hang around when we praise God, especially for something that doesn't make sense. And God works through that. I don't even know how, I just know it's never failed me. If you're in big trouble, Lord, thank you for this, you're gonna do something, I'm gonna praise you. And just, I didn't make myself say that, but it's never failed, never. So, I want to thank you all for praying for us because we feel your prayers everywhere we go. And as my brother-in-law always tells me whenever I leave, he says, Dave, be good. Man, oh, that sticks in my head when I want to be bad. So I feel like I got a whole congregation of people saying, be good. So after we saw you all um, last summer, we went back to Iraq. And we met with Damoa, the little girl we rescued from behind the tank. We ran out. This, everybody else there was dead. Actually, there was two men alive at that point and her, and one guy got killed during the rescue, so we just rescued two, this man and this girl. But we didn't know where, where her family was, because her immediate family, her mom, her dad, her brothers and sisters were all killed in Mosul. But with the help of General Mustafa, uh, an Iraqi general, we were able to find her grandmother. 
and there'll be a there'll be a video online. I guess Josh can tell you about it, how to watch it. But there'll be a movie about it's just a five minute, six minute thing about finding Demoa's family. But we found them, or actually we didn't find them. The Iraqi army found them. So we reunited in November last year. And when I met the grandmother, the grandmother came up and she started kissing my feet. And I picked her up, pretty embarrassing. She said, I promised I'd kiss the feet of the man who saved my granddaughter, because if that didn't happen, I'd be dead. And she said, I had a vision. Well, what does it mean? I was in Dayala, far away from Mosul, and my, grand my, my daughter was killed, and I didn't know what was happening. I knew they were all dying. But it turns out that the same day the rescue happened, I had a vision of a man in white stepping over a putrid stream to pick up my granddaughter. Who was that man? I said, that was Jesus, and he sent us. So, Damoa now has a new start. She's six years old, that's the little girl we rescued, and has a grandmother and granddad and an aunt to take care of her. And that was a blessing, so that's an answer to prayer. That was November. After that, we also went and visited other people we'd rescued. When my translator, who I was very close to, Shaheen, was killed, at the same time, we were trying to pick up people off the street who were getting shot. There was a father who had been shot in the leg, and the, his daughter was running around screaming. And as we went to pick the father up, she was shot to the back of the head. The bullet came out of her eye. She fell down. I picked the father up, and he was shot in my arms, and I stuffed him in the Humvee. I picked the girl up, stuffed him in the Humvee. By now, our Humvee was so shot up, it couldn't move. During that whole thing, my translator was killed, and my driver was shot six times. So we eventually got a tank to come down and blast away at ISIS, and then another Humvee pulled our vehicle out. We evacuated the wounded and the dead, and we went right back into the battle not really knowing what had happened. Well, now we're back, um, now I'm up to still, still November last year, and we're going into Mosul finding out who lived, who died. And that little girl who shot through the back of her head, she has partial hearing loss, but that's it, and no eye, but no brain damage. I don't know how that happened. Just a little bit of hearing loss and this beautiful smile, and we're gonna get her a little prosthetic eye. And the dad who shot twice, he's totally fine. And I thought, wow, what a miracle. And to be able to, I thought, thank you, God. We not only were part of helping her and helping the dad, we get to see him again. And we love these people. And one of the, you know, people say, how do you know God's real? I know he's really changing my heart. I didn't know the Iraqis. I didn't love the Iraqis. I love these people. It's like my family. So we got to see them. My translator died, but um, the driver, my driver was shot six times. He became a follower of Jesus. We baptized him in the Tigris River along with one of my medics. And see, so we are in the Tigris baptizing Muhammad and Jason, our medic, in the ruins of the city, that, that wasn't ISIS plan at all. That wasn't Satan's plan. That was God, in spite of the evil things that happened. So I just kept thinking this whole time, wow, thank you, God, we get to go back to this place that was destroyed and find these people. We also found this lady named Kofran, that, the rescue that you saw that behind the tank, that was kind of, kind of a famous one, because it was filmed. But the next day, we found out there were people inside a Pepsi factory. There was five people left. And there was also about 100 people killed in there. And in the Pepsi factory, and one of the women had crawled among the dead bodies. She'd been shot twice in the leg, had a completely fractured femur. But she got a dead woman's scarf and tied it off so she didn't bleed to death. And she crawled around, put together a phone, called for help to Baghdad. Within one hour, the call came all the way through the Iraqi social network to us in Mosul, to the Iraqi army. And we went and did the next rescue, which I talked about last year, which was the power of God. Because again, we're in the ISIS building. And just had, I finally just had to say, in Jesus' name, ISIS, you can't stop us. You can't hear us, you can't see us. That sounds like crazy talk. But that was the only way to get through their building. And then Satan and all you demons, you cannot stop us either. And if you don't like my prayer, talk to Jesus, because I'm right behind him going like this. And I said that with like this much faith, like a thread. So, but it worked, we got everybody out. And some of y'all saw last year, we, we, drug, we had to throw one line out to this lady and drug her off the street so ISIS couldn't get her. We could hear them talking, they didn't know we were there. We got them all out. Well, this woman who'd been, who did an initial call, she's now had multiple surgeries and we're working on more, her name is Kofran. And I said, um, now we're here to help you again in your rehabilitation to get more surgeries. And she said, you never have to help me again. You risked your life to save my life. 
When I was shot twice and hit the ground, my family was with me. They looked at me and ran because everybody's getting shot. Boom, 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 boom. So dad just grabs the youngest kid and watches me and runs. So who came to help me? You, an American. Wow, not even my family. So she started to cry, I started to cry. Uh, wow, dad, what a gift. I get to be with this person and see her again. She's a shining lady. And we're working on more surgeries for her. But these were gifts that we got the experience going back. I do have a prayer request. Is the lady we drug in, we haven't found her yet. It turns out, and she's alive, but her husband was ISIS. So she's afraid to come out of whatever refugee camp she's in because she might be killed by other people who don't want any ISIS left alive. So her name is Imam, which means faith. Is it? Who's Arabic here? Hope it means faith. Faith or hope, I was getting mixed up, but it's good. So please pray for Imam and that we could find her. I'd love to see her again. Because as we drug, drug her in, she said, thank you, God. Thank you, Lord. And she looked at me in the eyes and said, thank you, brother, for not leaving me. Wow. So from there, from Iraq, we were going into Syria also. And we got into the ruins of Raqqa, which was the capital of ISIS. It was their strong point where they projected their power to the rest of Syria and Iraq, and eventually they fought the world. And we're in the ruins of this church, and that's where Sahel later on learned to sing the song he just sang, and sang it there. I thought, wow, God, you did something good in the midst of this, this destruction. So then we come back, and we go back to Burma. And for you, for anybody who's followed Free Burma Rangers, <laughs> it's been around for 21, 22 years now. It was our anniversary. And we baptized 12 of our new um, rangers which you know, you can't force anybody to be baptized. That's the power of God in their life. Including one medic who'd been with us for two years in Burma, I mean, in Iraq, and still wasn't a Christian. But he said, I saw what God did in my heart and what did in the Iraqi's heart, so I wanna follow Jesus. So that was 12 of our people. Then we came back to Iraq again. Now we're up to um, January. No, before Iraq, we're back in Burma. Someone's asking about ceasefire earlier today. The situation in Burma is like this. The army really controls everything. Aung San Suu Kyi and the democratic movement, they have a little bit of power, but they don't make the final decisions. So Burma has actually become worse. You have 750,000 Rohingya chased out into Bangladesh. You have the Kachin in northern Burma under a constant attack. This week, the Karen in southeast Burma under attack. One of my team members, I just heard today before church, has just been captured by the Burma army. His name is Serdo, which means big sweep. So please pray for him. So it's not a very good situation in Burma. In January, while we were there, in between the Iraq missions, I met this little girl. She's not really a girl, she's a woman. She's 18 now. And so she's about that short. And she walks up with the baby, says, do you remember me? I was like, wow, you're not Mudewa. Yes, when she was eight years old, she was shot in the stomach by the Burma army. A lot of her family killed at the same time. And she was in a coma for two weeks in the jungle. They just put IVs in her, had nothing else. And she lived. But I remember when I, when I, 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 a picture was sent out for her to me, and I remember seeing it back in Thailand, and that same day I'd been talking to some people in our government, and they said, hey, why are you going to, over the border illegally? And that just makes problems, it makes problems for us. I was like, Ooh, that's not very nice to hear from your own government. And I was kind of discouraged. I thought, okay, this is what we do. And I saw her photo and said, please pray for her. She's been shot in the stomach, a lot of family killed. And I said, that's what we go, for little girls like that. So it wasn't a month until a month later I went back into Burma. This is back in 2001, 2002. And I said, I got to this village that had been mostly destroyed. And I said, where's the, where's the um, burial ground for Namudewa? I was pretty sure she's dead by now. I said, no, she didn't die. She's right over there. And she walked up to me, with a scar, scar right here, the bullet's still inside. It's one millimeter from her spine. It's lodged up by her liver. And she walked up to me and she said, I'm alive. And I got on my knees and just started crying and saying, thank you, Lord. Wow, she's alive. Well now, coming to this year, she walks up with her baby. She says, I'm still alive, I got a baby. <laughs> and um, it was awesome. Later on, the next month, Burma attacked again and she had to run again. So, but she's still alive. So this is the up and down. So that was January. We go back to Iraq, February, back to Syria, and then back to Burma, more attacks. We're trying to follow up and we're trying to help people. And I, this time I brought with me a Yazidi, that's a sect in, in Iraq, very persecuted by ISIS. A Yazidi leader who'd been with us in all the battles. He got a passport, total miracle, and a visa to Thailand. And I brought um, Mohammed, my driver who'd been shot six times. 
became a follower of Jesus, one of the guys that baptized. I brought them into Burma. These guys don't walk. They're all mechanized in the desert. We're going up and down big mountains. And Edo, the Yazidi with a gigantic mustache, goes, I saw death today. <laughs> I never walked this much. No Yazidi has walked this much since 500 years. <laughs> but they, they got with all these hi people hiding, about 2,000 people hiding in the jungle, including um, Namudewa, the girl who shot in the stomach, the baby. And the, they could relate with the Karen people what was happening to them. And they talked about following God and even in bad times, not giving up faith, not giving up hope. God has a way. Someone just told me, God doesn't give you a smooth ride necessarily, but you get a safe landing. We, we do. That's heaven and even now in the midst of trouble. So they were sharing that and we didn't have the power to do anything about the Burma army. And actually this group of people we were with was mostly uh, moms and kids and the husbands were out trying to find animals and bring them in before the Burma army got them or defend from a new attack. And we came to do a program and I had nothing in me to do a program. I thought, what program can we do today? So I just said to the ladies, I said, you know what? We just need to pray. We need God to do something. We can't generate anything. So we sat down with these ladies and we all prayed and I had them pray and lead us in prayer. And it was a holy moment and after that prayer, within two weeks, the Burma returned and went back. Now, they'll probably come again. But I thought, wow, God did something in that prayer. So then we came back into Iraq and then into Syria. And how much? Am I about out of time? Okay. I don't want to go on. Um, we come back to Iraq. So we're going back and forth, Iraq and Burma, and bring these guys out. The, the, the Muslim guy who's now a Christian and the Yazidi come back to Iraq and we go into Syria. When we get into Syria, what we're doing in Syria is we're doing medical care for anybody we can, and I have a great team. Um, I was telling Phil just yesterday and um, Craig about my team. I have some superstars. Ilya is champion kickboxer, always chewing beetle nut, everything's a big joke. Um, but he really cares about people. And I was becoming irritated with this one, with a whole bunch of um, patients. They were telling us, all oh, they need this help and this help, and they're stealing our stuff at the same time and pretty rude. And then they were saying, well, we can't take this medicine now because there's Ramadan and we're very holy people. And I was like, well, well, come on, man. And I said something about that God wants us to be free and that Muhammad didn't have our best interest in mind and that Jesus did. And I said, I thought I said it very lovingly and kindly, but I probably didn't. And Ilya, my medic from Burma, he just steps in front of me. So I can't see this lady anymore. She can't hear me. And he starts taking care of her. And he turns to me and lady goes, try to be good. I thought, wow, God, you gave me such great people. And the Iraqis don't know what to do with them. Most of our medics are about this tall. And it's, this is silver horn and slowly. No, that's Tom and Jerry. That's how they think of them. But, but the current people we get to take to, from Burma into Iraq and Syria just make friends in ways that way past what I can do. So I just thank God for that team. So we're back in Syria. And we're treating patients. We're doing good life club programs. And also we're building playgrounds. Everywhere we go, we try to put a playground in. That's not our normal free Burma Ranger thing, but it's something that we've been doing in the Middle East, which people love. Like one father in Syria, he said, he brought his daughter, he said, you're not just doing this for our family here in Raqqa and Tabqa, you're doing it for all Syrian children. Oh, wow, it's awesome. And everything's going well. Well, towards the end of our time in Syria, the Turks, just a quick little picture of Syria. So if you imagine Syria, is that screen up there and that's north so that's east here's west here's south that corner up there would be afrin the the left northwest corner is afrin turkey would be above that and down here is israel and the syrian government kind of controls this half and the kurds and with the americans kind of control that half the other side of the euphrates but that upper quadrant up there matt if you can imagine that's afrin that was an enclave the kurds also controlled is one of the last free places in syria and people had fled from Damascus and other places and had safety there. But the Turks didn't like it, even though they are a NATO ally. And they told the Americans, you better not support the Kurds there. We're gonna take over because the Kurds are getting too strong. So the Turks, January this year, invaded Afrin, along with their proxies, Free Syrian Army, many of whom are ISIS. That's a whole other story. They come into Afrin. Where is Afrin? I, I start looking it up. It's the place where Uriah the Hittite died. That's one of David's best soldiers, who's super faithful, and gets sent, but David gets his wife, has an affair, 
the wife gets pregnant, he wants to cover it up and brings the husband home to sleep with the wife because I'll fix it. But the husband says, how can I sleep with my wife and my men on the front line? That's Uriah. Mm -hmm. So then David's general says, send him off <coughs> back up to that area of north, northwest Syria. When, we, when the fighting's at its worst, because he's always brave to beat the front, we'll pull back and leave him to die. And that's what happened. That's where he's buried. His tomb is there. Many Christians were there. About 3,000 Christians were there until the Turks came in. Turks came in and put in Shariah law. 35,000 Yazidi who were oppressed minority, they had to flee. Whole place got emptied out. Now it's full of Turk-backed forces and um, ex-ISIS guys. Total mess. So those people had to go somewhere, and they fled across the Euphrates. That's where the Kurds and Americans are. And then you can imagine this picture. So the Syrian army, backed by Russia and, Syria, and in Iran, has the western half. The Kurds have the eastern half, backed by the US. The Turks have the northern border. And so we got a big problem to pray about. But meanwhile, these Yazidis and Christians fled. We started meeting them in Kobani, which is on the, on the east side of the Euphrates River, and other, other places. And there was one village outside of Kamishli that had used to be all Christian. But the Christian fled in 2014 when ISIS took over. So it's been empty since then. So these Yazidi had a place to go. So they all come in, and they come to this new destroyed village, new to them. And the Yazidis are there. And we come in and we're doing medical care, Good Life Club, t-shirts, all this stuff. Everybody loves us and we love them. And we're like, wow, man, we're like real missionaries. We're doing good stuff. And in the middle of that, there's this blown up church. And I start going up to take photos. We always take photos. Everybody wants you to take photos because they want the world to see how many bad things ISIS has done. And, that, and then that's our job anyways. And so we're always taking photos. So I get my camera out. I'm taking photos of this blown up church, the same picture that Karen showed this morning earlier. As I'm doing it, this guy comes up behind me. He's got, a, everybody's got weapons, but he's got, he got a uniform and weapon, and he walks up, and I can feel the vibe, like, this guy is a punk. <laughs> you know? and, and he comes up and he says, stop taking photos. He says it very rudely, like, stop taking photos. And my first thought was, one, you're not my boss. Second, you have no authority here. Third, we're running this whole relief thing for you guys. And it'd be kind of like if you were in the mall and someone came up to you and said, I saw you speaking in Idaho, you're going to pay a ticket now? You'd be like, hey, man, who are you? <laughs> and so I, and, and in, in these conflict areas, everything's elevated. Everything's, I, I never realized that till later, but everything is elevated, all your emotions and everything. And he's, he comes up and he just comes in like, like, a, like sticking something at me. So I think I have two Christian responses. One, I can just turn around and say, hey, man, Move out, because I'm not going to listen to you. That was my first good Christian response. And then the second one was, I'll just ignore him. Because sometimes you just need to ignore people like that. Just ignore him. And then I just said, Jesus, what, do you, what is your way? And I don't know why it's so hard to say that prayer. What is your way? And it was like a huge struggle in my heart. Okay, I'll do it your way. One, his way sometimes doesn't seem to make sense. Second, sometimes it's impossible because you think our, you know, our way is the only way it's going to work. And I said, um, okay, I'll do it your way. I surrender. I'll do it your way. And I turned around, and I think when we say that to God, he does something supernatural through us. I, I didn't feel any different, but I, something, my heart must have already changed. And I said to him, thanks for providing security for the Yazidis here. He's like, oh, well. Huh? And I said, tell me your story, man. You wanna know my story? Yeah, I wanna know your story. I'm saying this to the translator, the same one that taught Sahili the song. And he's a Christian guy named Bashir, Syrian. And he said, my story, I'm a Yazidi, so ISIS captured me in 2014. I was held as a slave working for them for two years. Constant work, and they tortured me and locked me up every night and beat my legs so I can barely walk. I lost many of my family and my friends. I'm a wrecked man. And I say, like, whoa. Can I, can I pray for you that Jesus would heal you? Oh, yeah. So through the translator, I held his hands and I prayed, Lord Jesus, please heal this man emotionally, psychologically, mentally, physically, in every way, in Jesus' name. When I got done praying, he was crying. And I was crying. And he hugged me and he said, thank you, brother. Whatever you want to do, I'm at your service. <laughs> and I want you to meet my family. 
So I wanted to close with that because that is Jesus' way. And I know it isn't always that neat. Sometimes when you do Jesus' way, people attack you. But you're clean and free. And he is supernatural God. He helps us do things we cannot do on our own. That's his job. That's what he does. We just need to call on his name and obey him. So I, I'm going to finish with that and close with a prayer. I'm out of time, right? Okay, because then I got one more story. All right, because I, I, I just thought of it. I just thought of it. I was talking with Doug Yoder, one of my chaplain guys. He's somewhere around here. And this really will be the last story. Um, this is an old story. I may have told it in this church before because it involves Burma and it involves prayer. And it's about Jesus' way, not our way. So the Burma army is attacking. And they're attacking in three different areas. And I have 21 guys. And I divide them up, 777. Seven, seven. And there's a valley. It's at night. And they're coming up. They're already, they've already wiped out a bunch of places. They decapitated a guy. left his headless body in the trail to scare the villagers. They're going to attack the villagers behind us and my families with them. So we can't just run away. Usually, Freedom Rangers, we actually run away a lot. Our job is pray and run away with everybody else. But you can't run away if people can't run away. That's the one rule we have. I mean, the biggest rule is follow Jesus. He tells you to run, you do. But you can't, we couldn't run away then because it would expose all these people. So we're praying there, and we're in a ravine, and here comes the Burma army. You could hear them at night moving. It's, you always make noise at night. Clink, clink, clink. 400 guys coming up, and there's get seven of us. Because I have three different passes they could come through, and the Burma army picked our pass. So I got seven guys to stop them. And we had some old rifles. We had a couple old pistols. And my... And we prayed about doing this. And we felt we should. And about midnight, though, I'm praying again. I can hear the burn come in. I whisper to Monkey. He's the same guy who filmed the, the rescue. And he's with me. And I said, Monkey, is this right? That we're going to try to stop the Burma army? Because we're probably going to kill some of them. Then they're going to kill all of us. And he said, yes, we prayed. This is what God wants us to do. But, you know, my pistol doesn't even work. Ha, 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 ha. And so I was like, oh, man. So I said, Lord, how do I pray? And I think sometimes, you were a lot, I've said many Jesus help me prayers, which work. But sometimes when you got big problems, I, don't, I didn't want to just babble and start just throwing out things. I want to know what God wanted me to pray. So I said, Lord, how do I pray? And he gave me three prayers. The first two I've prayed many times before. They were easy to pray. In Jesus' name, I'm saying quietly, Burma Army, stop. You can't hurt us. Second, in Jesus' name, we, our group, and our families don't get hurt. Easy prayer. And I said it with faith and conviction. The third prayer Jesus asked me to pray, I couldn't believe it. Pray that they go back and they don't get hurt. I'm like, no way. No way. Because there's three reasons why that's a bad prayer. One is it's physically impossible. Because as they come in to attack us, the Kren, they're like Davy Crockett and Daniel Boone. They're going behind, even the ladies, putting in landmines, setting up ambushes. They're going to make the Burma army pay for every step. I have never been on a mission when the Burma army attacked us, they didn't get killed. Ever, ever. Because the people are going to shoot at them the whole way in and the whole way out. So I said, God, that's not a reasonable prayer. It can't happen. They're going to die. Some of them. Second, that prayer is not just. They will not get what they deserve. They're decap decapitating people, chasing us around, going to kill my family. Is it just to let them go home? That's not just. Third, then I won't be a hero, man. I won't be able to shoot these guys. And I'll have no part in this except being the praying guy. That's not very hua. And, but these were my three reasons I didn't want to pray. One is it was impossible. Second, it wasn't just. And third, it was my pride. And I felt God ask me, are you going to obey me or not? Oh, man. Okay, I pray that. In Jesus' name, Burma Army, stop and go home and don't get hurt. And 30 minutes later, they moved. They went to another pass. We moved to that pass. Kept shifting our team. For four days, they did this. And we never met each other. Finally, they went home. No one ever found them. No one was hurt. And I thought, wow, God, you really care about our enemies. These are all your children, too. So I just want to add that story about prayer and doing things Jesus' way. They work better. So I'll pray. Lord, thank you for your help. And Lord, right now in this, in this church, there's people that are sick and haven't been healed yet. I haven't asked you for healing. So I, Lord, I ask, number one, that you please heal them. And please heal us. And then number two, give us peace and faith. 
Um, maybe there's people with lawsuits and impossible business situations. Lord, we ask for your help too. Um, not just from the sidelines, but get in there with us and help us fix it. Ask for protection. Ask forgiveness for our sins. Ask for new starts and relationships. And thank you so much for being with us here. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.